Hello everyone, Mason here. How are you doing? Today, I want to talk about some Lord of the Rings. In fact, I'm here to pitch five Lord of the Rings spin-offs that I would love to read. Before I get started, there are three channels. In Deep Geek, Men of the West, and Nerd of the Rings that I found invaluable in creating this video. I'll leave links to their channels in the description. From one of the greatest mysteries to one of the most formidable, villainous figures in Tolkien's Legendarium, these pitches will never happen, but if they did, I'd love to read them. Let's get started with number one, what happened to the Entwives. The Ents were some of the oldest beings in Middle-earth. They were created by Yvanna in an attempt to protect the natural world against the resourceful nature of the Dwarves. They were designed to be the shepherds of the trees and taught to speak by the Elves. There were the Ents and the Ent Wives, and between the two, there was a difference in attitude. The Ents took a more passive approach. They were concerned with the taller trees, content to allow nature to take its own course, growing wild, changing and evolving over time. The Ent Wives, however, employed a more hands-on approach. They were concerned with the smaller trees, with the grass and the flowers. They would eventually leave the Ents behind, crossing over the Anduin to settle in a green and luscious land between Mirkwood and Mordor, where they would create gardens that they would tend to lovingly. They would even teach the people that lived in those lands to farm, to care for and cultivate nature just as they did. Although this split occurred, there was no bitterness, no animosity between the Ents and the Entwives. In fact, for a while, the Ents would, from time to time, travel to visit the Entwives. However, times grew dark, and this happiness could not last. Towards the end of the Second Age, during the War of the Last Alliance, Sauron was on the defensive. He desperately needed something that would hinder the advances of the alliance that had formed between elves and men, and so he adopted a scorched earth policy that would lead to those green and luscious lands between Mirkwood and Mordor being destroyed utterly. They were left desolate and nothing more could now grow there. They became known as the Brownlands, which the Fellowship sees as they journey along the Anduin in the Fellowship of the Ring. Eventually, the Ents would come to the Brownlands, where they would find the gardens of the Entwives destroyed and the Entwives themselves missing, with no hint as to where they had gone. They asked the people who still lived in those lands where the Entwives had gone, and yet nobody could give them a solid answer although some did say that they had left in search of a new home. The Ents began to search far and wide, but as time passed, they began to travel less often and not as far. So, by the time of the Lord of the Rings, the Ent wives were simply a memory. Treebeard at least didn't believe that they were gone completely, insisting to Merry and Pippin that they were lost and could not be found. So, we're left with the question, what actually happened to them? The truth is, we just don't know. It's one of the enduring mysteries that Tolkien left behind, and it's clear that the man himself didn't even have a concrete answer on the subject. On one occasion, he said that he had no idea if they would ever be found again, because he'd only written a small portion of the Fourth Age. On another occasion, he said that he suspected that they had indeed been destroyed by Sauron's evil. As I mentioned, Treebeard himself didn't believe that they were dead. Of course, this could be the naive optimism of an old man, but it depends on how you look at it. Is it more likely that they were destroyed by Sauron's scorched earth policy? Yes. Is it more satisfying? Well, that depends on what kind of person you are. 
Do you believe that evil inevitably robs us of the beauty around us? Or do you believe that somewhere, somehow, it will find the way to survive and prosper once again? It's worth noting that whilst their searching was extensive, the Ents didn't travel everywhere in Middle-earth. Treebeard had never heard of the Shire, nor of Hobbits, and he repeatedly asked Merry and Pippin to describe the Shire to him, saying that the Ents wives would love it there. The Hobbits themselves once lived in the lands around the Anduin. Let's not forget about Old Man Willow, who the four Hobbits encounter in the Old Forest. Of course, he could have been a Huorn, a creature that's much more like a tree than an Entis. However, there's also the fact that in the Fellowship of the Ring, Sam tells Ted Sandyman a story that his cousin once saw a moving tree. It is in the realms of possibility, albeit a hopeful possibility, that upon leaving the Brownlands, the Entwives discovered the ancestors of the Hobbits, took them with them, helped them set up the Shire, taught them to farm, and the Hobbits inherited their love of agriculture and the beauty of nature. I would personally love to read a short story that centres around what happened to them. I don't want to tie a neat little bow on the situation. I don't think that it should focus on their rediscovery. I just want to know what became of them. Keeping it to a short story would ensure that you didn't have to explain too much or go too far. We could simply learn what happened to the Brownlands in a bit more detail. We could learn whether they escaped or perished. It could be heartwarming or heartbreaking depending on what happens. It wouldn't even need to be a short story. Poetry is such a large part of the lore of Middle-earth that I think that would do it nicely as well. Just like with the rest of these spin-offs I'm going to be talking about, it's never going to happen though. And so, in my heart, I will believe that they did indeed help the Hobbits set up the Shire. It's just the nicest way in my head. 2. The Adventures of Gimli and Legolas When we talk of friendship in The Lord of the Rings, we most commonly give credit to Frodo and Sam. Whilst this credit is most certainly deserved, I think we do a disservice to Gimli and Legolas. Their friendship is unique and very special. They are two men from completely different cultures with values at odds with one another. There's so much animosity between them. As they become friends over the course of the trilogy, they build a bridge over a chasm that's existed between their peoples for thousands of years. By the time that they emerge from the mines of Moria, everything begins to change. Gimli, who is struck by the beauty of Lothlorien and of the Lady Galadriel herself, shows such a reverence for the elves that Legolas begins to see him in a new light. As they journey along the Anduin, Legolas brings down a fell beast. Gimli notes the skill of Legolas and the craftsmanship of the bow that Legolas uses, provided by Galadriel. By the time they encounter the Riders of Rohan, Legolas is more than willing to fight Aomer to defend Gimli. During the Battle of the Hornburg or Helm's Deep, they play the game that we're all familiar with, keeping a record of their kills to see who will dispatch more orcs. Their situation is dire, they're outnumbered, it seems that they're more than likely going to die and this game is a way that they can laugh in the face of death together. Afterwards, it's Legolas that sees the beauty in something he usually would not. Gimli describes to him the glittering caves of Aglarond, expressing his desire to take the dwarves there and have them tend to the caves. This is where they strike their bargain. When the war is over, when the ring is destroyed, should they both survive, they'll travel together, so that Gimli can see Fangorn and Legolas can see Aglarond. In Minas Tirith, 
Gimli talks of how the dwarves could improve the stonework, and Legolas of how the elves could bring the beauty of nature to the place. By this time, they've come so far. An elf and a dwarf walking side by side, their values now aligned, discussing how they could work together in harmony to make the city a better place. As we know, they do both survive, and they do travel together. It's not until the year 120 of the Fourth Age that Legolas builds his boat in Athelion, and together they travel once again along the Anduin until they sail out of Middle-earth and to the Undying Lands, where Gimli can once again behold the beauty of Galadriel, an honour which few dwarves, if any, have ever had bestowed upon them. There's a lot of space to breathe in 120 years, and I would love to read a book that focused on their adventures after the War of the Ring. Their journey to Fangorn and Aglarond, their banter as they argue over which one is more beautiful. The work they do with Aragorn to rebuild Minas Tirith, and any other adventures they may have taken. It would be a fun read that maintained the adventurous spirit of the main trilogy, whilst also providing some recognition for a friendship that is underappreciated, in my opinion. 3. Sam Gamgee's Non-Fiction I think most of us love Sam, and I am definitely one of those people. Whilst I wouldn't want a new story about him, I would like to read a series of non-fiction written by him. Give me Gardening with the Gaffer, where Sam and his father talk about the best way to grow potatoes or tend to a garden, where they talk about the plants and the wildlife that you're most likely to get in the Shire, maybe even with some input from Merry and Pippin on the history and uses of old Toby. Give me Grilling with Gamgee, where Sam talks about his favourite recipes and how to make them. Give me Gamgee's Kitchen Nightmares, where Sam talks about what not to do while preparing food. Honestly, this one's a simple one. It'd basically just be gardening manuals and cookbooks, but with Sam's personality, and I would just get a kick out of it. 4. The Blue Wizards Gandalf, Saruman, Radagast, Alatar and Palando. The five Istari, sent by the Valar to assist the peoples of Middle-earth in their fight against Sauron. Whilst Gandalf and Radagast would remain in the northwest and occupy the areas of Middle-earth that we are familiar with, on arrival, the Ithrin Luin, or the Blue Wizards, Alatar and Palando, would travel to the east along with Saruman. Unlike the other three, Alatar and Palando had been dispatched for a second time, having had some great success in the Second Age, where they'd worked in secret to tip the balance in the favour of the enemies of Sauron, so that by the time of the War of the Last Alliance, Sauron was able to be defeated. So this was their task once more to journey to the east where it was believed Sauron had fled, as he had done in the past, to locate him and work against him in secret to make sure that he did not outnumber the forces of the west. It seems that their task was one of stealth, they didn't make themselves known in the west, instead journeying straight to the east with Saruman. Sauron was not there, but they weren't to know that. Saruman would not return for 1,500 years, and when he did, he returned alone. After this, he was much more concerned with finding the One Ring than he was with finding Sauron. What happened to Alatar and Palando, we don't know. Whatever their fate was, we do know that despite their success the first time around, Despite the fact that they were able to hold Sauron at bay for a good chunk of the Third Age, by the time of the War of the Ring it seems that they had failed. Sauron greatly outnumbered his enemies. When he reveals his might at the Black Gate, it's pretty clear 
that he would have been victorious had Frodo and Sam not been on their own stealth mission. Once again, what actually became of them is unknown, but we do have clues. Tolkien once said that although their fate was unclear, some held that they fell into evil and became servants of Sauron. He also once said that he suspected that they formed cults and magic traditions that outlasted Sauron himself. Now I find all of this incredibly interesting and there's so much material to mine. What happened in the east? Why did Saruman return alone? What were the blue wizards doing during the War of the Ring? We know so little about the lands in the east of Middle-earth and so little about the people that live there. We could have multiple books that focus on the blue wizards, following them as they begin their journey, steadfast in their resolve to carry out their task, and slowly but surely becoming more and more corrupted until they serve the man they were sent to work against. What were these cults and magic traditions? What were their purpose? What did they do? What part did Alatar and Palando play in helping Sauron form his armies? What happened to them when the War of the Ring was over? We know that they didn't return to the Undying Lands, as Gandalf was the only Astari to do that. There's so much to learn, and I think it would be a fantastic series. 5. The Witch King of Angmar This one would be the cream of the crop, the masterpiece, in my opinion. The Witch King is one of the most powerful and feared entities in Middle-earth, especially in the Lord of the Rings. He is the Lord of the Nazgul, Sauron's second in command, and he's responsible for some of Sauron's greatest victories, including the destruction of the two greatest kingdoms of men in the Third Age, Arnor and Gondor. After his re-emergence into Middle-earth at the beginning of the Third Age, he quickly got to work. First, he set his sights on Arnor in the south, which was in itself split into three kingdoms that squabbled amongst themselves. He formed the kingdom of Angmar on the outskirts of Arnor, where he amassed an army of darkness consisting of orcs, evil men and other creatures, as well as his own sorcerers, which is how he earned the title of the Witch King. Then, using spies, he infiltrated the court of Rudor, until it was completely under his control, after which he got to work hunting the Dúnedain. He captures Cardolan next, and when the Dúnedain attempt to hide in the Barrow Downs, he sends what would become known as the Barrow Whites there, which is where we meet them in the trilogy. After that, he moves on to Arthurdain, which proves to be more difficult. He gets overconfident, and this leads to him suffering a loss at the hands of an alliance formed by Círdan and Elrond. He doesn't give up completely though. After waiting around 500 years, he tries again, captures the capital, there's a climactic battle and the Witch King flees rather than face Glorfindel, but the damage has already been done and Arnor has fallen. Then he summons the other eight Nazgul and turns his attention to Gondor in the north. Eventually he would kill Gondor's last king, transform Minas Ithil into Minas Morgul, recapture Osgiliath and set up Mordor until it was safe for Sauron to return. The Witch King is a powerful, formidable force. With a combination of his dark magic, strategic and political manoeuvring as well as military might, he more or less single-handedly brings about the destruction of Arnor and Gondor. I've seen a lot of people say that they would like a touch of Grimm in Middle-earth and I think that this would be the perfect series for that. With the Witch King as the protagonist, you could flesh out the magic system. We could learn more about what the Witch King and his sorcerers are capable of. What it's like to be one of the Nazgul. What it's like to be one of Sauron's trusted servants. 
Although I'm not a fan of political intrigue, I know a lot of people are, and I think there would be plenty of potential for that. It would make for a series with a much darker tone, and it would work well setting up events that we know from The Lord of the Rings. I'd love to know what you thought of my pitches, guys. Would you read these books? What Lord of the Rings spin-offs would you like to read? Let me know in the comments section and we can have a chat about it. Then, be a good friend and share some of your old Toby with the like button. He's got a real talent for blowing smoke rings. As always, the link to my Twitter is in the description and if you choose to subscribe, I'll be eternally grateful. Thanks ever so much for spending time with me today, guys. Until next time, take care. For now, I'm off, and you should have a good one.